the so social psychological reasons, that's, that's something what is coming from the, the depth of my heart. Uh, and in case of uh, Slovakia especially, uh, it's mostly authoritarianism, which is reproduced from one generation to another. I, I have no clue what's the situation in Turkey. But in, in, case of, in case of countries such as Slovakia, Poland, Hungary, uh, what we found out in, in last years is that uh, certain, certain people are, have been voting for authoritarian uh, rulers. They will vote for them even in the future because they are representing authoritarian personality that was described a long time ago by people like Adorno and something. Uh, and honestly speaking, when, when I'm counting how many people like that live in, let's say, in Slovakia, it's definitely more than 50% of total population. You know, so so if you have people who are authoritarian personalities, don't expect in, in such numbers. Don't don't expect that uh, country will be not struggling with democracy. You know, with, with the democracy regime. Uh, because it will be it will be coming very very easily with every single elections again and again. Uh, fourthly, and this is something what we tend to forget uh, in many countries, and Slovakia was a perfect example of it. We believe that civil society is something warm, fuzzy, pleasant. Uh, that civil society uh, are full of people who are helping. Uh, their neighbors, etc., etc. They have good intentions. That's nonsense. Uh, civil society might be also uncivic, anti-civic, non-civic. You know, that doesn't. Some parts of civil society don't have ethos of civility, so to say. Uh, in many countries, think about Croatia. How groups of veterans were blocking the chances of democratization of, let's say, Croatia. Uh, in or fascist groups in countries such as uh, Slovakia or Hungary. Are they part of civil society? Definitely they are. But they are at the same time working against civility of, of those countries. Uh, but we, and, and what we didn't pay attention to is that some parts of civil society started to change their character and started to work against, uh, against democracy. Uh, and most importantly, the last sentence, Suddenly, what we realized in, at the beginning of the 21st century that there are people who are politically uh, who are politically participate who never participated before. They didn't participate for, for decades or never. And suddenly, especially social media, awake them and we are dealing with people who don't have civic skills, so to say. I'm, I'm not sure whether this is the case of Turkey, but in, in case of case of Slovakia, uh, we have a, um, the whole army of people who don't have skills to behave uh, properly as, as agents of change, so to say. Uh, the next one, uh, um, you know, the, the problem is failures of so-called so liberal democratic uh, elites. Uh, uh, very often populists who are participating in democratic politics utilize extremists as negative frame of reference. This is, by the way, the reason why very often extremists survived on our political scenes, because, in fact, populists needed them uh, to be part of political scene. Suddenly, everything what populists represent were more, more and more acceptable. And don't forget, returning to how I started, we are suddenly in the 21st century in a situation when everything was tested. You know, theory of elites, Marxist theory, state corporativism, uh, societal corporatism, everything was tested. You know, in a way, we now, we might envy people in the past, how, how they were devoted to fascism, communism, corporatism, social democracy, uh, conservatism. You can, you can pick up whatever you want, because they, they still believed it very much. The 21st century is full of cynicism, and I would even say nihilism about it. We don't believe that it might work again. Uh, and that's behind it as well. Uh, impact of social media and, uh, and influence. 
I'm not sure about uh, Turkey, but in case of Slovakia, uh, Democrats are losing. A, thank you, losing uh, again and again because of online radicalization and polarization of population through social media. Uh, I believe that, especially countries like Slovakia, Hungary, we are living basically in conspiratory hell. People don't believe in anything. They, they, there is very low trust between people. So. So, in fact, they are ready to believe whatever they will find on, on Facebook. Slovak media, I, I would still advocate, it, are relatively good, definitely comparable to anything you can find in Western Europe, but uh, most people don't, don't read it anymore. You know? They rely on nonsenses coming from Facebook, from their friends and their families. Uh, and suddenly, uh, suddenly, Various types of radicals are focusing on young generation without civic skills, without a historical memory, and they are extremely, extremely successful. Uh, so let, let, let me give you an example. Uh, degree of belief in conspiracy theories and misinformation narratives. You have various countries of Central and Eastern uh, Europe. I, I don't know what I'm doing. It's because of the laptops. Okay, okay. You, you see? So, uh, let's say your neighboring Bulgaria, together with Slovakia, are reaching very high levels uh, of belief in conspiracy theories. This is kind of an index of, uh, of conspiratory. And again, if you have, let's say, 17 or 20 percent of people who are conspiratory in a country, you can still handle it. But as it is the case of Bulgaria or Slovakia, so it's 50 or even more than 50 percent who are falling in that group, suddenly you have a problem, you know? People who are, who are actually not living in the real world, they, they deviate it some, somewhere, and, uh, and these are consequences, yeah? So let's say, in case of Slovakia and, Hungar and neighboring Hungary, basically half of population believe in, uh, uh, in conspiracy, Jewish conspiracy, that the Jews are ruling this world. Well, you know, I mean, you are walking, you are walking on, you are laughing because it's the same in Turkey. Yes. Am, am I right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that, that, that's why you are. Yeah. Five, five family uh, are ruling the world. Uh, so, yeah. And you know, and it's not about Jews anymore. In fact, you know, because it's an imagine, imaginary Jew. You know, he she doesn't have a face. You know, uh, it's it's belief in some some kind of uh, domination of the world uh, elites or here. Uh, those who agree that world affairs are not decided by elected leaders, but by secret groups aiming to establish a totalitarian world order. Well, look at your neighbor in Bulgaria again, or Slovakia. Again, it's more than 50% of people who believe, uh, well, to, to some totalitarian uh, secret groups. I mean, think about uh, the, this absolutely uh, bizarre conspiracy theory uh, QAnon. I mean, it's kind of a proof that you are basically on the level of uh, primary school. That there is a pizzeria, pizza house in, in Washington D.C. There is a basement, and in the basement, Hillary Clinton and others are sucking the blood from virgins and kids. You know, I mean, and there is no basement actually of that pizza house. You know, that's that's the beauty of it. Uh, and still, uh, in, in case of U.S., there is more than 10% of people who believe in, in QAnon. Okay, so this is more sophisticated, so to say, but, but it's more than 50% of people. Uh, how you want to, in the long term, uh, preserve democratic regime if you have half, half of people who are living in this type of, of world? But as I see that we are sharing the same experience, okay, okay well, let's, let's discuss it in, in, uh, in, in a discussion. Uh, yeah, so again, I will not go to, into uh, media uh, resp responsi responsibility of social media. Uh, everything what appears in social media look equally legitimate. But what it's provoking is this diabolical causality. Diabolical co causality, uh, which is replacing reality with irrational myth and prevents the search for the real cause of negative social phenomena. Uh, people are unable to find real solutions precisely because they are paralyzed by the fact that somebody is manipulating everything and everybody. 
Yeah, it's directing the anger of masses of people uh, at the supposed culprits, etc., etc. Et uh, and something what is important to, to mention here, in many of our countries, and I would be curious about, about your Turkish experience, and recent experience, uh, it's also historical legacy. You know, in the 90s, uh, Slovak sociologists were puzzled uh, why in some regions people are voting autocrats more than in others. Uh, and, and again, those answers that it's economic, uh, le level of economy, level of unemployment, etc., was absolutely false. And what they found out was that those who were voting for authoritarian uh, political parties and even semi-fascist political parties at the end of the 30s, before the World War II, those, their uh, grandchildren now are in the same regions voting for autocrats again. So, so basically it was not about unemployment, it was about that shift in generations that those who were authoritarian in the 30s are authoritarian even now. Yes, so the historical legacy, uh, this is the uniform of uh, fascist, fascist, Slovak fascists from 30s and 40s, and suddenly you have this is a leader of Slovak fascists who, thanks God, is disappearing from a political scene at the moment. Uh, but you know, many, many people in Slovakia believe that these are just some uneducated idiots, uh, you know, who will disappear very soon. Not at all. You know, these people, and they are unemployed, and that's, that's why they are uh, frustrated. Look at the characteristics uh, of people who are voting and who are voting for Slovak fascists. Male, employed, uh, educated, I mean not perfectly educated, but uh, it's not true that they are all uneducated, daily user of internet, uh, they have basically average income, rather believer, but not, not deeply as a, as a Christian, and the other neighbor is absent. So the other neighbor, uh, gypsy, Hungarian, you know, somebody who might provoke those reactions is absolutely absent. You know, so suddenly you have you have a new world. You know, this this is this is the answer of 21st century. Okay, and last one. I know that I'm I'm speaking a lot. So after everything what happened in century or in, in the last years, the certain avant-garde of that backsliding from uh, liberal democracy is definitely Hungary in the region. Uh, Hungary, we have a suspicion that Hungary is not democratic state an anymore. We have a lot of proofs of it, uh, and probably that's why uh, Hungarian political scientists and Hungarian sociologists are, at the moment, probably the best to name what's happening, uh, what's behind it. And uh, it was a political scientist from Central European University, at the moment in Vienna, not in Budapest anymore, Mr. Sharoshi, uh, who came with the idea that, uh, that backsliding is a result of a sick state, that the state became sick. Uh, and became sick because, and it's a mental uh, illness, uh, which we, he called paranoid governmental disorder. So Central Europe, uh, he suggests, is starting to suffer by mass psychogenic illness, the rapid spread of illness, signs and symptoms affecting members of a cohesive group, originating from a nervous system system disturbance. Yeah? And these are seven definitions of a paranoid governmental disorder. And I would be actually curious, what, what, what would you say, whether you see some uh, similarities with Turkey. Uh, excessive government control and surveillance. Tendency to restrict, secondly, tendency to restrict individual rights and freedoms. And the passing laws restricting the freedoms of NGOs to raise funds abroad, etc. Tendency to perceive disagreement as treason. Uh, and, and honestly, this is something what we were not used to, even in the 90s. Uh, if you had a, somebody who disagreed with you, well, that's a person who disagrees with you. But now, suddenly, he is a traitor. You know, if he disagrees, he is a traitor. Uh, and, and this is how some governments, and the Hungarian government is a perfect example of it, is starting to, to behave. Uh, uh, recurrent suspicions without justification regarding the patriotism of vulnerable minorities or civil society groups. So, uh, whether you know the permanent question mark 
whether some groups are uh, patriotic enough, so to say. The tendency to experience excessive importance of the nation state, you know, so this nativism typical for uh, many, many uh, extremists. Tendency to appeal to frustrated middle class to exploit their fears and anxieties. And, seventh, preoccupation with unsubstantiated conspiracy theories about the internal and external enemy. Uh, and Saroshi uh, basically defined already years ago that in case of Poland and Hungary, all seven symptoms of paranoid government disorder uh, are there, and in case of Slovakia and Czech Republic, less. You know, so there, fortunately, you know, and, and this is something what gives us hope, both in Slovakia and the Czech Republic, that we, we might eventually avoid the, the destiny of, of Poland and Hungary, uh, but some, some of those uh, symptoms are there. So, uh, you know, it might happen to us as well, uh, but of course we are, we are doing everything we can to, to prevent it. Uh, so, the last slide, uh, and then we can have a long dis discussion about this backsliding to, from illiberalism. I believe that what we are experiencing these days in Central Europe is the end of liberal consensus about the future of the region. You know, so, and again, uh, don't, don't mix it with reactions to uh, war in Ukraine, where many, many of these countries were reacting uh, according to uh, I, I would say general consensus within the European Union and uh, also according to our historical experience, experiences with Russians and, and Soviet Union. But it doesn't mean that that itself is helping us to foster liberal democracy uh, within, within the region. The region started to backslide back in time and in the last uh, important information and this is kind of a, may, may, for, for some of you, might be intellectual gain, but uh, after all those years, since 1989, I, I have a tendency to believe uh, all these intellectuals, such as uh, Milan Kundera, Giorgi Schöpflin, Claudio Magris, and others, who are basically said, saying that as unpleasant as it may be, Central Europe may, be, may have become laboratory of events that will also affect the West. Uh, that basically Central Europe somehow represents a preview, a premonition of early warning system uh, about what awaits Europe. So, uh, as many times in the past, Central Europe have been avant-garde what happened to Europe later. Uh, and and that's, why, that's why it's so important to speak about it, uh, because it might affect and the waves of it might come not only to Western Europe, but also, also to uh, parts of Balkans, which at the moment are desperately trying to become part of the European Union. And of course, speaking about Turkey, it's, it's basically the, the, the same. You know, I, I strongly believe that Turkey sooner or later will become a member. member. I, I see that you are laughing. No, 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 I, I believe in it. Uh, the problem is the size. You know, sizes and, and the problem in Western Europe that some, some people have lack of imagination that you have a common border with Iraq and Iran. Uh, we in Central Europe, we are not afraid of it, you know, we are fine with that. Uh, but uh, simply, uh, until we will reach that point, Central Europe might uh, simply be an avant-garde of, of a, the problematic Europe that will not wait uh, for Turkey on its way to the European Union. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Osinska. Now, if you have any questions, please you can forward. Thank you for, for the for your presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, in your last sentences, you, need, uh, you, you said that uh, Central Europe is the Rwanda guard of the Europe. Uh, so, uh, as we talked about the European Union, what, what European? We heard a lot of criticisms from Hungary, or uh, some uh, criticisms, harsh criticisms. But what European Union is doing for to to uh, to prevent this backsliding in Central Europe? Uh, what, what kind of initiatives they are taking? Uh, can you tell us about that? That's a 
a very good question. And uh, honestly speaking, uh, in the last uh, 30 years, very positive role was played by Visegrad uh, group. Uh, remember, in the 90s, Slovakia was the weakest point. And uh, all neighboring countries uh, helped a lot. They were, they, they were very much aware that without Slovakia, the whole region would be incomplete. Later, uh, there was an extreme patience on the side of, again, Slovakia, Czech Republic and Poland, uh, with a hung regime in Hungary, which day by day was starting to be more and more problematic. But, but, but again, uh, Visegrad group was always the platform of, uh, of a mutual understanding within the region. Yeah, and uh, now, for the first time, I, I would say, uh, we are in a position when um, the Visegrad is is collapsing. I, I, I would go even even that far. Uh, especially Czechs are extremely impatient. Uh, they they basically don't see much reasons why to be associated with uh, regimes in Warsaw and Budapest. Uh, on on the other side, Warsaw is increasingly impatient with these three relatively smaller countries and they, with the self-confidence typical for, for Poland, which is a relatively big country, as for the region, uh, they are building the initiative of so-called 3C initiative, initiative, so basically cooperation within the triangle Adriatic, Baltic, Black Sea uh, of countries between Poland up to Bulgaria and Croatia. Uh, we'll see what what will happen, uh, but yes, suddenly the preservation of liberal democracy is not top priority top priority of, of the region, and and that, that that is happening for the first time. Uh, I, I can give you an example. Much more uh, stress is put on uh, finalizing infrastructure, building of infrastructure between those countries. So basically, something that is not associated with democratic regime. You know, highways and good railroads you can have even between uh, between plutocracies and oli oligarchies. You know, that's that's uh, and that's a sad story in a way. Yeah. So of course, I don't want to be pessimistic, but for the first time uh, in in our history of last 30 years, this is not top priority. Is it, you know. Uh, and we, we were still living in a, in a world where we took for granted that as members of the European Union, we cannot deviate dramatically from a democratic regime. That it cannot happen. And then Hungary came and they proved that actually it might happen. You know, it's as easy as that. I also want to ask a uh, contributor uh, question. Uh, in the beginning of your uh, presentation, you said, uh, I speak before my ambassador uh, in a relief. And how far back can you trace your uh, relief? Uh, how did the uh, European Union contribute uh, to this relief? Or, uh, how did institutions change uh, in this process? You, you mean the, in uh, terms our, of our European membership? Yes. Mm -hmm. In oh. terms of democracy. Uh, well, honestly speaking, uh, in, case of, in cases of the Czech Republic or Poland, uh, I would say that those countries, because of uh, various historical reasons, uh, have been on a way to democratic regime even without the pro uh, prospects of the European Union membership. As for Slovakia, without prospect of being European Union member, Slovakia, it's very questionable whether we would get rid of autocratic regime in the 90s. So it was absolutely crucial. I mean to say that it was not only vital but crucial. Uh, for, for Slovaks, uh, the image that we might we who deviated in the 90s from the path typical for all others in the region, uh, it was absolutely vital that with European Union uh, membership we might, uh, we might get rid of all those people, uh, we might be prosperous, 
and at the same time we might have a free institutions. And honestly speaking, this is you know with problematic moments, but this is our, our reality for the last 25 years. Honestly speaking, you know, and I'm, I'm not hiding that Slovakia is a country uh, with a lot of problems. Slovakia uh, is a country with so many people who are authoritarian that basically that part of society is very loudly uh, screaming, we want to have autocratic regime with a strong leader, but there, the other part of society is still, up to now, strong enough to, to make sure that Slovakia is exactly as I said, free, free country and 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 demo, country with democratic institutions. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, but uh, and, and by the way, uh, this is this is the policy of, of Brussels uh, as far as Western Balkans is concerned. Mm -hmm. You know, just think about Northern Macedonia without prospect of being a European Union member. Uh, I, I you know I would be very skeptical. Uh, you know how how that country would uh, progress. Now, you know, we don't know what will happen, but uh, definitely many many positive changes we encountered in northern Macedonia. Not so many in Serbia, but that might come as well. I would like to uh, first uh, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. I would like to stress something on Turkey, uh, as you have uh, made many comparisons or uh, inspired us uh, to think about Turkey on uh, such comparisons. Uh, it was uh, very nice of you, thank you very much. Uh, but uh, let me give you some insights. Uh, one might be, uh, regardless of how the country is uh, being considered from outside, uh, it should be stressed that uh, what is now being experienced in Turkey is probably a disillusionment of uh, institutions of the EU vis-à-vis uh, -vis, uh, what has been experienced uh, in the backsliding uh, process of the country uh, in regards to democracy. And I would uh, frankly uh, like to stress that uh, Turkey has been uh, abandoned by the EU institutions uh, and this has been done uh, mostly due to the crisis, the migration crisis that has been faced uh, not only in Turkey but uh, mostly scared by uh, the leaders of the EU and obviously the peoples of EU. So, uh, it should be stressed that uh, the idea uh, that uh, democratic institutions would contribute to Turkey uh, is not relevant, uh, while uh, now the opposition in Turkey is trying to get together itself and uh, to try to overcome uh, an oppressive government in the country. And as you are uh, in an institution, uh, of the state, uh, still we can uh, have our say, uh, just as you have your say with your ambassador. That should be kept in mind, uh, I think. And so this is this is the one thing that I have to stress: this disillusion. And if it is not improper, I would like to ask you uh, something uh, to compare uh, between. Czech, Czech Republic and Slovakia, as these two countries were together uh, until very recently, uh, why the numbers are uh, shockingly different. Uh, and, uh, and with, uh, with uh, some points uh, that might be a little bit uh, critical in your presentation, if I may. Um, I do not believe uh, that these uh, tendencies are new to us, as Adorno has done in the research which you have uh, somehow referenced to uh, the authoritarian personality uh, uh, study, uh, was definitely giving uh, everyone uh, the opportunity to see and understand that liberal democracy 
uh, is inherently uh, uh, carrying these uh, uncivic, with your terms, uh, values. You know? So I think uh, today uh, defending cosmopolitan values and being in favor of civic values, uh, much more egalitarian policies, and being radical uh, with the uh, with the etymology of the of the term, I mean, being radical with freedoms, uh, or being in favor of uh, radical freedoms, if I may say, is the only solution today. Uh, not any kind of uh, conservative liberal understanding of how these institutions may be reformed. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so those are already three yep. uh, different different issues. Well, let me start start with the first one. Uh, well, that, that's that's a tough uh, tough question, and uh, and, and you are right. Uh, Turkey was uh, to a certain extent abandoned by by the European Union. Um, the, the prospect, and, and and of course, the the question is, what was the first? You know. Uh, egg or, or chicken, uh, whether it was, you know, those were certain tendencies within Turkish society which provoked uh, Brussels to react in a certain way, or when Brussels, uh, Brussels was reacting uh, in prolonging the whole process, it provoked those changes within the Turkish society. And it's probably both. Uh, uh, and the truth is that uh, and we witnessed it uh, since 90s. In 90s, the membership of the of, the, of Turkey in, in the European Union was not uh, that ideological as in in last 20 years. Uh, I remember uh, in 90s that very few people were using the argument that Turkey is a country predominantly of Muslims. It didn't play much role. Later, it started to play the role. Yeah. Secondly, uh, as I as I mentioned, suddenly. Uh, we will have a border with uh, Iraq, Iran, and Syria, and okay, well, enough is enough. You know, uh, suddenly it appeared, but in the 90s it was not on the table. It, it was not that important. Uh, or just demography. Uh, you know, hey, uh, you would be the biggest uh, European Union country, bigger than Germany. And suddenly you have, you, have a, you know, it's, it's a club where there is this delicate balance of power, very delicate. And always when something happens, uh, the whole European Union is shaking. You know, when the Great Britain left, it was, you know, like the boat which was basically sinking. Uh, and suddenly with Turkey, which is big, you know, it's a challenge. You know, I'm not, not saying it's a problem, I'm not even saying it's impossible. I'm just saying it's, it's a challenge. And, and yes, you are right. The, the, the problem is that once Turkey doesn't have a prospect of the membership, uh, Mm, yeah, it's the, the internal politics look very differently suddenly. And I was referring to Balkan. Balkan without the prospect of, of European me membership. Oh, I don't want to see that mess, you know, what, what, what might be there. Uh, there might be easily, easily in the next war, uh, you know, in Serbia. You know, I, I don't want to go in, but with prospect of uh, the European Union, suddenly it's not that tragic, you know, and then we can, European Union has this luxury. <laughs> I see that you are smiling about it, yeah. but it has this luxury of, of at least uh, waiting for b better times. You know, in case of Bosnia, it's 30 years already, yeah? and, and those better times are not coming, but still, at least, at least there is no, no, no war. Yeah? Uh, the second, uh, and that's easy, that's easiest, Czech Republic and Slovakia. Yes, we were part of the same country, but uh, look, Slovaks and Czechs are very different. Very, we love each other, and genuinely, if, if I will show you public opinion polls, you know what would be your uh, question? Why you split it in the country? You love each other, so what's the problem? We like each other very much, genuinely. Uh, it's almost suspicious how, how those relations are good, but at the same time we are very different. You know, Czechs are much closer to, to, to Germans, Slovaks are much closer to Hungarians, and even to Balkan countries, in this respect, I would even argue to Turks, you know, to to, to certain extent, of course. Yeah. Um, so uh, Slovakia was originally hundred years ago.
very poor agrarian country. Czech lands were the engine of the, of the monarchy. Don't forget, when Habsburg monarchy collapsed, 52% of total industry were in Czech lands, what today is the Czech Republic. So you had basically, you know, highly industrialized part of, of Europe and Central Europe, probably the most industrial. You know, Czechs were staring at the Austrians from above, like, these are these peasant, the Austrian peasants, we are the industrialized nation, yeah? And suddenly you put together agrarian Slovak with highly industrial Czechs, and Slovaks uh, received a, a chance, a lot of, you know, fantastic chance to catch up. And Slovaks utilize it in, in a, the most positive way you can think of. Uh, there, are, there are even, uh, you know, saying, coming from the Czech lands, uh, that 20th century was a century of Slovaks, that nobody utilized it better than Slovaks did. And I agree with that. You know, Slovaks were extremely successful. And the question is whether they will be successful in the 21st century, but that's another story. Uh, but simply, those two, those two nations are very different uh, up to now. So that's why they react differently. Uh, there was a, a very different approaches to transformation process, uh, very different uh, ambitions at the beginning of our transformation process, and we can go on. And the last, last point, uh, let me tell you how I understood it, that you were basically putting a question mark uh, about what's wrong to be slightly more radical, you know, and to challenge even liberal democratic regime, which is bringing also a lot of problems, which I agree, it brings a lot of problems. Uh, and, and you were referring to some, some radicalization of modernity, that we have so many troubles and uh, challenges ahead that we cannot we cannot uh, allow ourselves you know, to have this luxury of uh, answering new questions by old answers. Yeah? Uh, that's basically what, what you were referring to. Yeah? Am I right? Not really. No, not really? No? You know, social sciences is always dealing with what has been done, what has been spoken of. We are still reading Aristotle and Plato, so... Yeah, true. <laughs> All times. Yeah, that's, that, that's true. Uh, so, Okay, so how, how should I understand your, your question? Because, uh, because you, you, you raised the question. It was not a question actually, it was uh -huh. a statement that uh, trying to look for answers uh, for the crisis that is being uh, experienced in Europe or uh, in the world uh, today cannot be answered with the uh, actual uh, grammar uh, of the mm -hmm. ongoing uh, conservative liberal discourse. Mm -hmm. Uh, we need a much more radical democratic approach mm -hmm. uh, in order to handle uh, the situation. Otherwise, uh, it would be, uh, in my view, uh, uh, just uh, reawakening of uh, what has been experienced in the 30s and what has been uh, considered or seen uh, in the 50s and today and so on. It would, uh, it would keep coming back. It's not, it's not a new tendency, it is an inherent uh, problematic in the unequal societal uh, formation mm -hmm. of liberal democracy itself. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, in my view, it is time to recognize the reality and try to find concrete answers uh, to the problem. Yes, yeah, so, so you are raising the question whether liberal democracy is actually able to survive uh, the, the ch challenges that are knocking on the door and, and they will be coming e e even more, in, in a more brutal way. Uh, again and again. Uh, well, yes and no. Look, uh, we are very, as we are sitting here, people from Slovakia, we all know uh, how Brussels functions and sometimes it's driving us crazy, I have to tell you. But at the same time, uh, you know, sometimes it's slow, sometimes it's very bureaucratic, but at the same time, truth is that the European Union is surviving all crises better than uh, all those nation states who would survive uh, alone. And secondly, although certain rules of the game are definitely not authoritarian, on the contrary, very liberal, European Union is, is able to handle crisis, energy crisis in, in last year in a fantastic way. Uh, speaking about environmental uh, problems, I mean, there is a struggle, uh, and, and once you have uh, almost 30 countries in a club, it's still more and more complicated. But in spite of that, 
Brussels is able to push agenda uh, faster than than most of countries of the world. You know, so and that gives me hope. You know, I'm, I'm not saying nobody said it will be easy. Yeah, but and we are very, very nervous sometimes. You know, there is a meeting, there is a summit of the European Union. The topic is uh, uh, war in Ukraine, and for the whole day they are discussing. Uh, engines uh, in Volkswagen and in Mercedes, you know, and it's driving us crazy. But somewhere at the end, uh, you know, after a few months, the, they reach the, the decision which is actually jumping over uh, all others, you know, and then it's faster, in fact, it's faster than in the United States very often. So that gives me hope. We didn't uh, exhaust uh, the topic, but we definitely exhausted ourselves, as I say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. For your Thank you very much for your presentation.